Um, so I do have a joke for you guys today. Uh, I, I hope you guys don't laugh at my lameness. Hope you guys laugh at the joke. Um, but so I do have a joke. I have a spiritual thought I wanted to share with you. And then afterwards, uh, Joey, could I have you say the opening prayer for us? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> here comes our joke. Walter took his wife, Ethel, to the state fair every year. And every time he would say to her, Ethel, you know, I'd really like to go on a ride in that helicopter over there. But, that, but Ethel would always reply, I know that, Walter, but the helicopter ride is $50. And $50 is $50. Well, after years and years of going every single year, they went to the fair one year, and Walter said to Ethel, Ethel, you know I'm 87 years old right now. If I don't ride this helicopter this year, I might never get the chance again. Once again, Ethel, Ethel replied, Walter, you know that helicopter is $50, and $50 is $50. This time, though, the helicopter pilot overheard the couple's conversation, walked up to him and said, listen, folks, I'll make a deal with you. I'll take both of you for a ride. If you can both stay quiet for the entire ride and not say a word, I won't charge you. But if you say just one word, it's $50. Walter and Ethel agreed and, went up, the, and up they went into the helicopter. The pilot performed all kinds of fancy moves and tricks, drove by beautiful scenery, but not a word was said by either Walter or Ethel. The pilot did his death-defying tricks over and over again, but still, there wasn't so much as one word said. When they finally landed, the pilot turned to Walter and said, wow, I've got to hand it to you. I'm, I did everything I could to get you to scream or shout out, but you didn't. I'm really impressed. Walter replied, well, to be honest, I almost said something when Ethel fell out, but you know, $50 is $50. I guess those weren't death-defying tricks. <laughs> yeah, seriously. All right. And then for our spiritual thought today, uh, so First Nephi chapter 13, verse 37 says this, And blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth my Zion at that day, for they shall have the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. And if they endure unto the end, they shall be lifted up at the last day and shall be saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Lamb. And whoso shall publish peace, Yea, tidings of great joy. How beautiful upon the mountain shall they be. I was reminded of this um, after reading a quote by Winston Churchill. He said, Continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, is the key to unlocking our potential. What about life? The struggle to endure to the end, the relentless challenges that we sometimes face, habits that we want to break, good habits that we want to form, things that we want to change about ourselves school that's difficult, other stresses in life that we have to go through, uh, trying to learn a new programming language, and how in all of this, it isn't strength or intelligence, but it's continuous effort. That's the key to the key to enduring to the end, the key to finishing strong. It's that continuous effort. And, you know, so while we're going through this class, if, if you come across something that's hard, just remember that, you know, it's it's not that you came into the class and you were super smart and you already knew everything ahead of time. It's not that you have a, a good tendency to learn really fast and it's really easy to learn. None of that matters. What matters is that you don't give up and that you continually uh, exert that effort. So that's my thought for today. All right, Joey, go ahead. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for us to be able to gather, even during these hard times, to continue to learn and to grow and to become better people and stronger people. We thank thee so much for your gospel that inspires us to be better people and to continue to learn and grow. Um, we thank thee so very much for all the blessings you give us and the peace and comfort you can give to us. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, guys, how's the class going so far? How are y'all feeling? Good. Okay. You know, I, if, if anyone wants to complain, you totally can. I, I hope that you recognize, and I surely recognize, that this is a new course. It's the second semester that it's being taught. Um, but I hope that it's not just a class that you guys feel like you have to take because of whatever degree that you're choosing, but I hope that it's, it's something that you enjoy, you know. And not everyone likes programming, um, but I, I certainly love being in programming classes and being able to create things that didn't exist before. I, I absolutely love programming. So 
so if you guys do have any concerns or things that you're like, dude, this is awful, you know, just don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here for you. I'm not just going to be like that teacher's like, you don't like my class? Fine. Here's a note. Like, no, you can, you can talk to me about it. And uh, um, that's totally cool. So, all righty. Well, it looks like we've got a pretty good group of people here. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me share my screen. And all right, calling functions. Um, so let's see here. It, it's always kind of difficult getting a feel for where uh, students are coming from, especially just because this is a new course and, and a lot of things were changed over the last couple of semesters. Um, but hopefully all of you guys have come from a class where you did something with functions, okay? The three main classes that I can think of that you would have taken before this are CSE 110. Uh, did it raise your hand if you took 110? Did you guys do anything with functions in that class? A little bit. Okay, cool. So hopefully, at least you know that functions exist. Okay. Um, and then there's CIT 160, uh, which you guys have functions in there. And then CS 124 um, obviously has a lot of functions. So hopefully you guys are all familiar with a, with a function, with what a function is. Um, but functions are there for a number of reasons. Uh, in Python, you declare a function uh, using the def keyword, D-E-F. Um, and a function is a group of statements or computer commands that together perform one task. All right, now, uh, there's a difference between an ideal function and a non-ideal function. However, they're both functions. So if I wanted a function that performed a billion tasks, technically I could write code uh, to make such a function. Ideally, a function is a group of statements that together perform a single task. Python itself includes many built-in functions, such as input, print, open, len, range, in, float, string, abs, around, list, set, there's one more down there, and dict for dictionary. Okay, so these are all functions that are built into Python. Okay, we looked at a couple of these last week. Um, we, we looked at a small piece of code, and I asked you guys, I'm like, how many functions are in this piece of code? And I think there were like four. There was, uh, there was an input, there was a print, I don't remember what there was, but I think there was about four functions in there. Um, but several people answered with zero because I had not used that def keyword to define a function. Okay, so as far as functions that I had written, there were zero. I hadn't written any functions, um, but there were still four function calls in there. So let's look at that real quick. Uh, let's see here. So let's look. I wonder if our week two prove will have anything. Okay, so here's my week two prove. Um, if you guys are looking at this, you're like, oh my heavens, this is like the answer. There's already a video out on it that came out like 13 hours ago. Um, but so this is my proof. I'm gonna blow this up a little bit. And notice, how many functions did I write in here? Three. Okay, so there's an answer of three. Let's look back at our slides real quick. Okay, we have this def keyword to declare a function, to declare a group of statements uh, as a function. Let's come back over here. Um, I'm just gonna say Python function declaration. And we can kind of see what this looks like. Oh, were you saying if you declared one or how many did you use? Yeah, a good distinction. So I, I asked how many I declared, but both are important. Okay, so right here, here's the syntax for declaring a function. So you have def, then the function name, any parameters that you have, maybe zero, but you're gonna have the parentheses anyways, and then a colon, and then a list of statements. Okay, so in this piece of code, all right, for a number of functions that we're using, uh, we can count these up. We have open with two parentheses, products.csv and r, we have csv.reader as a function. Uh, coming down, we have input, is digit, print, len, print, len, print, and another print, okay? So I didn't even count that, but there's a bunch. All right, and these all, if we go back to our slides here, are these built-in functions. Now, this is not by any means a comprehensive list. Uh, we don't have is digit here, for example. 
there are many, many, many built-in functions in Python. Um, a couple of things to note, though, uh, right here, pnum, okay, we have an input from a user, and we assign it a variable name, in this case, pnum, all right? And right here, I say, if this is not a digit, okay, so if I was going to search for this in Google, notice right here that it says Python string is digit. Okay, so this is a method or a function that's built into Python that only works for strings. Okay, I can't just run is digit by itself, kind of like I, how I can run print all by itself or len all by itself. Okay, is digit I attach to a string and then it checks to see if that could convert into a digit or not. So in this case, when, when, when we run this file, the user will type in a number, and if they don't type in a number, then let's see, we'll just print invalid character in product number, okay? But if it is a digit, then this will return true, and then, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and, and print, okay? Um, now, so these are all built-in functions, the ones that we just looked at. And again, like we talked about last week, I can tell that these are functions because of these parentheses here that are being called. If I, didn't have any if, if I didn't have any parameters right here, it would just look like that, okay? I have an open function being called inside of a reader function, okay? Uh, same thing, I thought there was one more. Maybe there's not one more. But I have like this input function, uh, and then I have this print function. Right here, I could technically put another function call inside of here. Uh, if I had a string that I wanted to convert to a number or vice versa, or there, I could call a function inside of this print statement, okay? Similar to how we're calling this open function inside of this reader function call, okay? But this being our week two assignment, uh, I did not declare any functions in here, all right? Now, I could declare a function here just by saying uh, def and then the name of the function. Maybe this is uh, compute area. And then maybe as parentheses or as, as parameters, I pass in a width and a height. Okay. Now, just given a width and a height, it looks like I'm going to be computing the area of a two-dimensional quadrilateral probably, but maybe not. Um, so maybe for my, for my content here, I could say area equals width times height and then return area. Okay. That is a very simple example of a function. If I wanted to break it down a little bit more, I could just put that there. And instead of declaring a variable called area inside of here, I'd say, okay, this function is just gonna compute the area and return it. And so the user passes in a width of 10 and a height of 20, and we'll go ahead and return 200, okay? And we'll go ahead and do that math. And then this, this compute area function, I can use anywhere, okay? So if you guys were gonna think about why you'd want to make a function, what would be the benefit of creating a function. What do you guys think? It uh, reduces redundancy, so you don't have to write the same 10 lines of code, and so you could just write that one function. Yeah, Nick, thank you. Can you imagine if whatever was inside of this print function, I had to actually write out every single time? I mean, just in this application, I have four different print statements. That'd, that'd be a crazy amount of code all of a sudden multiplied in this thing. Okay, any other thoughts? It, um, it, lowers the chance of making mistakes. Say for instance, you did uh, just copy the pro general program for print and then later on you remembered something and changed it in one spot but forgot it in the other three. Yeah, Brian, that's huge. Okay, so uh, compute area, this is a really, really simple function. Okay, but let's say it's compute volume of a house that has 20 shapes in it. Okay, uh, I do not wanna have to write that uh, over and over again anytime I have to use it. And you're like, oh, well, I can copy and paste it. I don't want to have to copy and paste it either. You know, like Brian said, if I have to change it everywhere, that just sounds awful. And yeah, in text editors, I could select a string and hit control D and select all instance of it, instances of it and be like, I'm going to rename this to uh, awesome with. And that's just fine, but I still have to change it multiple places. From a performance standpoint, I still have to write it in multiple places. From a code size standpoint, I still have to take up code in multiple places. If I write this function in just one place, like this print function, that's just part of Python, you know, it's only written once, and then we can use it over and over and over and over again. And so there are a lot of really good reasons to use functions. Um, 
but among them is everything that we just said, and also from an organizational standpoint. Okay, from this slide over here, we said, all right, functions should be um, something that perform a single task. So right here, this compute area function, it computes the area, and that's it. Okay, this is, this is a good solid function because it does what it's supposed to do, and it doesn't do anything else. If all of a sudden I was like, you know what, I also want to uh, print the height just in case the user was curious. Okay, well, now my compute area function is like tainted a little bit. Because if I wanted to use this compute function anywhere else, well, what if I don't want it to print everywhere else? Okay, so, you know, I, I might want to make, if I wanted to print out the dimensions or, or whatever those parameters were, then maybe I could say def uh, print parameters or something like that. And then in here, I could say uh, param1, param2, param3, and whatever they are, I could just print them. And I could say print param1, okay? But by doing this, this print parameters is just gonna do that, all right? The name should be descriptive. It should be descriptive enough to get an idea of what your function is gonna do. So print parameters, compute area, pretty straightforward, okay? One's gonna print something, uh, whatever parameters are passed in, and one's gonna compute the area. Okay, now I could say compute and return area because really that's exactly what it's doing. It's computing the area and it's gonna return it. Um, but really in programming, um, there would be no point to compute the area if we're not gonna do anything with it. So that whole and return is, is, is implied. And so anytime I wanna compute something, uh, I, I can safely assume that I'm just gonna return that computed value. Because then I could say, all right, we have uh, a width of 10 and a height of 20. And then I'm gonna print just right from here. Um, and I can call that compute area function and pass in the width and the height. Okay, then this printing takes place outside of that function. All that function is gonna do is just compute the area. It just has that single task and it performs it and that's it. So when you're thinking about functions and how to make functions, um, anytime that you're going to have to do uh, math or a task, especially if you're going to have to do it multiple times, I would encourage you to split it up into functions. Because then this math of width times height, I'll never have to do it again. I can say, I'm just going to call my compute area function. And I'll never have to worry about having that math again. Okay, just like this print function. Now that I know how to use print that's built into Python, I never have to worry about how I'm going to display something in the console again. I just know I can use print. Okay, well, if I start writing a bunch of functions, you know, to, uh, you know, read through a CSV file, CSV file and print stuff, or compute the volume of a house, or anything, I can just have those functions built, use them over and over again. If I ever have to change anything, I just go straight to the function to change it, but it'll keep my code concise, it'll, it'll mitigate data redundancy, It'll keep it cleaner, easier to debug, easier to code. I can test these functions independently and make sure that they're working well before I put them into the rest of the program. And so because of all these reasons, um, we are going to be writing a lot of functions in this class. Starting in week three for the rest of the semester and probably in every programming class you ever take after this and in every job that you're programming in ever for the rest of your existence. Okay, Functions are huge and they're everywhere. Um, and it's because of everything, everything that we just said. All right, uh, you can read about the built-in functions in the built-in functions section of the official Python online reference. Um, and yes, a Python can save lots of time by using All right, so how to use a function. Programmer uses a function by calling it, also known as invoking it. So if I look back at this code, um, we, called the function right here. We invoked our compute area function right here. All right, um, but we declared it right here, okay? The declaration of the open function, the reader function, the input function, the print function, I'm not looking at. It's built into Python, and I might have looked at them once, but since then I'm like, you know, this input works. I don't really have to worry about how it works. And I just, I invoke the function when I call input, but I don't have to worry about declaring it because it's already been declared. When I make new functions, I declare them with the def keyword, all right? But if I didn't call it, then this code in here would never get executed, ever, because we don't call it, all right? Just like this open function, if I don't call that open function, then the code 
that is there in Python will never get run. All right, so this, I could, I could declare 50 different functions and they'll never get touched unless I call or invoke that function. Yeah. Okay. Now, not all functions will have these parameters. Okay. Uh, this example right here is three parameters. So if I was going to invoke that one, then I'd have to say, whoops, print parameters. I don't have to pass in three things. Uh, I could just say one, five, and um, this is a string. All right. But then that is actually going to call this, um, this function. And if these parameters are here, unless we specify that they're optional, then I'm going to have to pass in these values. There are a lot of functions that don't take um, a parameter. This right here is run on a string. And so um, this string is here, and we're going to check to see if it's a digit, but I don't have any parameters inside of these parentheses. And there are a lot of functions that, that don't take um, any parameters. Um, for, so for one example, let's say I wanted a function in an application that said, to display the time of day to the user or something like that. I could say def uh, print time and then I could use something else in here to find what time it is on the clock of the computer and then to just print that. But it wouldn't take any parameters. Okay. Uh, to call or invoke a function means to write code that causes the computer to execute the code that's inside of that function. Uh, during CSE 110, you often wrote code that called the input and print functions. So like this, input please enter your name and print. Okay, these functions that we've also been looking at today. So types of functions, okay. Now, again, this is not gonna be a comprehensive class time, okay. There are so many functions, you guys. If you wanna look at how many functions there are on a string, just Google Python string functions or Python integer functions or Python dictionary functions. And you will see huge lists that are comprehensive. But the majority of them, we're not going to touch in this class. So the majority of them, we're not going to talk about. Um, OK, so right here, uh, there are actually three functions being called. OK, um, so they will be called in order of, so abs is going to get called first. But to be able to pass in this parameter, um, it's going to have to call the float function. To be able to pass in that parameter, we're going to have to complete the input function. So the first function that is, that's actually going to be executed fully is this input function. Okay, so we'll run this program. We'll prompt the user for a number between 1 and 10. They'll type it in. And by default, that input function will return a string. Okay, and I could Google that. I could say uh, Python input, and we could see what it does. We can go to W3 schools. Um, here's the syntax to do it and it prompts and then it returns the string okay and so i could read more about it i could practice it here if i wanted to so they'll type a number this float function anybody know what that does that uh, converts it to a float yeah what does abs do absolute value yeah, I don't know if that was a guess or not, but yes, you're exactly right. So if I was going to get an absolute value of a string, what would happen? Let's try it. I don't even know what would happen. Let's try it. So hopefully I have this written somewhere. Week three, lecture, example one. Okay, so I'm going to comment out all of this stuff. Oops. And right here, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna copy this line of code. Oops, comment that one out. I'm just gonna take out this float. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna run this. Let's see if our play button works today. Nope, it's not liking it. Probably because of the input. So usually to run these, I'll just right click on whatever folder I'm in and I'll say open an integrated terminal. And then I can just say pi example underscore one dot pi and then run it. So it says enter a number between one and 10, I'll enter five. Okay, the absolute value of five, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm not a big math person, um, but absolute value is just the distance a number is from zero. So the absolute value of five, it's five away from zero, so it's five. The absolute value of negative five, also five, it's five away from zero. So we hit that, but then look, it says 
type error, bad operand for type for abs. And you can see it recognized that the input value that I typed in was a string. Even though I technically typed in a number, um, anytime you have an input, it will return a string. Okay, so if I put a float function here to convert this, hit save, I'm gonna run that again, type in five, you can see now it ran. Now it didn't do anything. I don't have like a print saying what X is. I, I guess I could put that there pretty easily. Five, and then it says, there's our absolute value. Okay, now notice it says 5.0. If I had, like said int there instead, type in five, now it just says five. Okay, that's the difference between an int, int and a float. All right, um, but yeah, so I have to do that if I'm gonna do any type of computation or any type of math with a value from an input. Now, whether this is good code or not um, is somewhat debatable, okay? Uh, because this will just break automatically. Uh, if I try to run this and I type in Fred, like that's a really ugly error that I wouldn't want users to see, okay? This from last week where we did um, if not, digit, like this is error checking right here, all right? If I wanted this example one to be nice and pretty and make sure that I don't get horrible errors like this coming back from my user, then I would just have to say, okay, um, I'd probably break it out a little bit, get the value, try to convert it, and if it doesn't work, then I'd go ahead and prompt them, be like, hey, you know, enter another number, all right? And that's where this while loop comes in, okay? So we set the need to prompt equals true, so it'll prompt at least once, they get prompted, they type in a number, we check to make sure that it is a digit in the range that we want. And um, if they enter something invalid, invalid, then it'll reach this. And well, let's see here. Oh, sorry. So if all of these pass, so if this is a digit and if it is in the right range and none of these conditions are met, then we'll go into this else statement and we'll say, okay, no more need to prompt. It'll come back up to the while loop and be like, oh, that's false. And then it'll jump down to our print, okay? But right here, where all this, like, yes, I can put all these functions into one spot, but I wouldn't have any way to check for that right here. So a better way to do it would be to take the input, put it right there. I could say like X string or something like that if I wanted to remember that, hey, this is gonna be a string. And then I could check, be like, hey, can I convert this to an int? Let's go ahead and convert it to an int. All right, any questions about this right here? Okay, sweet. Uh, let's look at our next one. All right, run x to whole number. Here's another function, okay? So we're currently looking at five different functions that are being called. We have abs, float, input, print, and round, okay? Now, if we use that round input, uh, let's see what happens. So we convert it to a float, and so if I run this, it says our absolute value is 5.0. And if I put round right here and run it again, okay, it just turned our floating point number into an integer, effectively. Uh, next one, okay, uh, we have input again. And this time, uh, we're, we're declaring this as a string. Um, now, if you look at this, based on what we learned up here, will this actually do anything? for us. No, it won't. Because inputs by default return a string. So even when I was typing in just the number five, it was still a string. When I tried to do absolute value on the string five, it was like, no, you can't do that. So for anyone who's like, okay, what is he talking about like string five and stuff? So when I type in five, that is obviously a number. Even my text editor can see that it's a number. It's a different color than a string. A string is always in quotations, but I could have this. It looks like a five, but it is a string because it's in quotes. Well, anytime someone types in something into an input box or into an input terminal cursor, um, it will always return a string no matter what you type in. And so right here, if I said, oh, let's take an input and let's convert this into a string, this code will run just fine 
but it doesn't it doesn't change this at all because by default this input is going to return a string. So. All right, next one print we've already seen len short for length. All right, so let's look at this. Uh, let's I'm going to delete, delete all this and we'll make an input and say please enter a word and we'll assign this to x. Okay, and then I can print the length of x and we'll see what we get. So come down in here, it says please enter a word, um, super cala, I'm just kidding. Okay, and we have 10 characters right there. All right, and so I can see that, you know, just length I can use anytime I want. I wouldn't have to print it. Lots of times you, you'll use the length function without printing it. Sometimes you'll need to know how many times to loop through something or some other type of computation that you'll have to do with input from the user. Uh, but in this case, we could just print it too and we'll get the length of this word that I typed. Okay, print type. So this is big, all right? Let's, let's put the type here instead. So we have the length of 10, I'm gonna put type in. I'm gonna run this and I'm gonna put in another word. And look at this type that comes up. It says class of string. Okay, let's try this again. If I just typed in a number, okay, notice it still says it's a string. Okay, and it's because input always returns a string. But let's say I put this as float. Okay, this worked earlier when we used our absolute value function. But if I run this again and I type in five, okay, now it says class float. So you can see that we were able to convert that string into a float. And then if we wanted to, um, you know, we, we could do some type of math or if I wanted to say X times five or something like that, we could do it now that that is a float. That didn't change this at all because we're not printing the value of this. 25 is still a float um, because it's being multiplied by that float. All right, import random. So random isn't imported by default, okay? Um, you all should have by now have used imports, importing different Python modules, okay? Random is one of them. Uh, and the reason why it's not included by default is to help make Python more, to help it perform better, all right? If you think about it, um, let's say, let's say I wanna read my book, okay? I just started Mistborn with my wife a couple of days ago and I wanna read my book. Okay, I got a whole bookshelf of books in my bedroom, but we wanna read the book in our living room. So I'm gonna grab a box and I'm gonna grab like 30 books, stick them in my box, go out to the living room, grab Miss Born out of there, and we're gonna read our book. Okay, that is why we use modules in Python. Okay, I don't need that whole box of books. Okay, there might be other times where I wanna read the scriptures or any one of those other books that I have on my bookshelf, but I don't need them all the time. And so by having these modules, we can access them very easily just by saying import random in this case. Random we could think of as another book, in this case, that I wanna read, that I wanna use. And so I just say import random, and then I have access to all sorts of, of functions and pieces of data that are inside this random module, okay? But just like with the books, I'm not always gonna to wanna to read all of my books at the same time. Usually it'll just be one, maybe two, you know? So by using these modules, Python, is able to perform better, okay? It's gonna be a lot more work for me to haul a box of books out to the living room than it would be just one book that I can hold in one hand, all right? Well, it's a lot more work for Python to load up all this code um, when 99% of it's not gonna get touched. And so that's why we have this import that's, and usually you don't use random, but if you ever need it, you just say import random and, and it's there and ready to rock, okay? Uh, any questions on that? I know I just kind of went on like a little module tangent, but any questions? The import statements have to always be at the top of the document? Yes. Yep. Well, random, random, is it only numbers or could it be like a string? Um, it's only numbers. Yeah, it's only numbers. I think this will actually run, Preston, to answer your question. Okay, so it did run. I didn't get any errors. You should always put these at the top, okay? Uh, anytime you have imports, you guys, um, you should always have them at the top, okay? But we just ran it, so it works fine using it like this, but you should have it at the top. 
Uh, all right, another one, we have the set function, okay? Uh, this is a function, and it's just a function to be able to create a set, all right? Um, and we could look at this if I said, I'm just gonna copy this line of code, Oop, not cut it, copy it, and paste it down here. And I'm gonna print the type of num right after having declared it. So if I run this again, oops. Okay, notice that this time it chose a class of set. So all the set really did was create a new variable that is this data structure, it's a set. Okay, but this is a function to be able to create a set and assign it, and assign it to a variable. Uh, and then we have max, okay? Max, it looks like it printed up 100, all right? And uh, num was coming from this set, all right? And the highest number in there was max. As you might guess, there is a min, there's like a mid, there's an average, there's all sorts of stuff. And if you wanted to learn what some of those are, I could just go to Google and say Python set oops, functions. Okay, and there's all this stuff in here. Okay, and so there, there's a lot. And like I said, we're not gonna talk about most of them because we're not gonna use most of them. But depending on what type of programs you guys write and how you guys choose to solve your problems, you know, I go to Google all the time. I'm like, how do I do this in this programming language? And lots of times I'll try to like figure out the best way to do things. Sometimes I'll try to figure out the most concise way to do things. Sometimes I'll try to figure out the most uh, well-performing way to do things. So if I'm in a bigger application that I want to go fast, uh, that I want to have go fast. Um, and so usually when I'm first learning a language, I'll Google something like this um, just to see, okay, well, what kind of functions are there in this language? Or um, if I look at strings, uh, what kind of functions can I use with strings? Or how do they, how do these work? Um, but then after that, usually I just Google, you know, like in this instance, how can I solve this problem? All right, so here's a good list of built-in functions. These are all really common. You're gonna use all of these throughout the semester a bunch of times, some more than others. Um, but hopefully this is, a, is kind of enough to, to help you realize that, you know, these are functions that we're calling. They are a part of the Python language and all Python is is just a big old set of code and all these functions were declared somewhere in it. Um, and that's what was downloaded on your computer when you started running Python, whether it was this semester or last. All right, modules. Okay, we talked a little bit about modules. Module is a collection of related functions. Python includes many standard modules which have many more functions, okay? So we looked at one module when we said import random. Random's a module, okay? And random had, what was that function we just looked at? Rand int, okay? Um, if I wanna learn more about the random module, random Python module, uh, we could look at this. Notice it's, it's straight in the Python docs. There are lots of third-party modules that people make. Those will not be included when you download the Python executable and stuff for your computer. Um, but anything right here, just like docs.python.org, this is all like built into that Python installation. Um, if you downloaded Python 3.8.6, you got it, okay? Um, but, you know, you can see here, there's like .seed, get state, set state, get ran bits, ran range, um, ran int, there's the one that we used, okay? And you can see it, it takes two parameters to, to specify a range to be in. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in this random module that you can access. And, but, but like we said earlier, you know, most applications, I'm not gonna have to use a shuffle function, okay? But if I have to use it, I can just say import random, then I can use random.shuffle if I wanna make like a little card game or something. All right, so any questions about why modules exist or how to use them? Okay, so the only one that we looked at is this import random, which is really easy to use because it's built into Python, all right? But knowing that there are many third-party modules out there, um, does anyone have any idea how to use those? Like this, it can just go into the Python files on my computer and find it and then make it accessible in my example one.py file here. But if I was gonna use a different module, like if Preston wrote a module and I wanted to use it, how could I use that? Can't you like search for them in the little bar and then add them? 
Yeah, yeah. So that little bar, I'm assuming you're talking about this little bar down here. Okay, but yeah. Um, you can search for them on Google and then you can use something called pip to install them on here. Pip is like a massive library um, that you can just like search for, for different modules online and once you find them you just say oh pip install whatever module you need and then it'll install it add it to the rest of your python files and then it'll be there and then anytime you need to use it all you got to do is just say import whatever module it was and then you have access to it uh, some examples of modules we have math okay usually i'm not going to have to use square root but depending on what program i'm writing maybe i'll have to use it so math is there csv Anytime I want to read or modify or, or use data from a CSV file. Array, space efficient arrays of uniformly typed numeric values. Date, date time, okay? So that one example, if I wanted to print out the time anytime somebody clicked on a button or something, I would have to use this date time, this date time module. Random, we already looked at. You can read more about the standard modules in the Python module index. Okay, so how to correct the call a function. Uh, you need to know the following the name of the module in which the function is located. All of these, other than this, so let me just take this out. Uh, all these functions here aren't located in any specific module. They're just part of like the root of Python, which is why I don't have to specify any type of module for them. If we look at random though, notice that I imported the module, then I have to say the module name, then the function inside the module. So anytime I, I, I download a module like math or array or, or date time, you know, if I imported date time, then I'd have to say date time dot get hours or get date or, but I have to say the name of that module and then the function. So you have to know which module the function is located in, the name of the function, the parameters that it takes and what the function does. Okay. Um, like I said earlier, ideally um, your functions only perform a single task. Um, ideally, you'll know what the function does before you call it. Technically, you could call it without knowing what it is. Technically, you could call it knowing the function module, the name of the function, and what parameters it has. Um, but yeah, ideally, you'll know what it does. Uh, this can generally be learned from the online documentation. Leonard, do you have a question? Sorry, in, in VS Code, it always will ask me like if I want to add an extension for this or something like that. Are extensions like similar to the modules? Um, that is a VS Code thing, um, but yeah, you could think of extensions as modules. Um, you know, like you think about my box of books. You know, I could think of VS Code the exact same way. You know, VS Code usually I'm not going to have to worry about how to use Rust, but if I wanted to start programming in Rust, I could grab another book or download another extension for VS Code to help me program in Rust. Um, so in VS Code. You keep on seeing this pop up in the bottom right corner to download a, an extension. Um, I have a bunch installed uh, based on things that I have done. Um, if you haven't done anything with AutoHotKey, you'd never have to download an extension for it. I downloaded it so, so that I'd have nice pretty syntax highlighting for any time I wanted to work on my AutoHotKey scripts. Um, I have stuff in here for Azure when I worked with Azure projects. I have stuff in here for C, C++. Code Runner is really nice. If you look at Code Runner, you can run all these um, different languages right from your terminal, which makes it really easy to run in this. Uh, debugger for Chrome, Docker, something for FTP, Git Lens. But none of these came with VS Code when I downloaded it. These were all just things I'm like, yeah, I want something to be able to generate an HTML file or an HTML file super, super fast, you know? Or I want something to help me with Markdown if I want to write anything in Markdown or with PHP. Or look at that, pip packages. That's how we download our, our Python, our third-party extension, or our third-party modules. So um, if you look here, I do have this Python one, and I highly recommend it. If you look here, it's got really good ratings and like 25 million downloads, okay? That's a lot. Um, most of these, if you look at this, like that doesn't even have 100,000, okay? Um, but Python's huge. That's why all of the, the programming classes here right now are, are Python. It's because it's everywhere. Um, but I would definitely recommend that you download this uh, but yeah, so these extensions, they just add to the functionality of your instance of Visual Studio Code. Okay. Uh, any other questions? That was a great question, by the way, Landon. Okay. Um, 
what time did we start again, you guys? Okay, 12.45. All right, well, let's keep going. Uh, so examine the following, math.square root, and we're passing in x. From this short description, we know that the name of the module, or the name of the function uh, is math, sorry, the name of the module is math, the name of the function is square root, and the function takes one parameter named x. Now, what we don't know here is a lot of the time there will, there will be optional parameters, okay? And that you just learned from the documentation. You know, you'll see a lot of the time you'll have like some function that you've been using a lot and you're like, wow, there are like five optional parameters that I've never touched before. Um, but you can learn that from, from the documentation. And again, like if you just Google Python math.square root, um, you'll see it come up. And, and, and it'll have everything there, everything for how to use it. This, this isn't even the, the official documentation. Um, but Geeks for, Geek, Geeks for Geeks is great. It goes through lots of examples of how to use it um, in different instances and stuff. Um, but yeah. All right, and the function computes and returns the square root of a number, okay? Um, that isn't explicitly listed here, um, but yeah. Uh, parameters and functions. A parameter is a piece of data that a function needs in order to complete a task. So if we look back, um, you know, if, if I have an input here and I don't prompt the user for anything, how are they going to know what to input? Uh, or if we have our random int function, uh, we should, I guess we don't technically have to have a range. Some of these are optional, um, but it's nice to be able to have a range. If I'm gonna get the length of something, I absolutely have to pass in a, va a variable or a piece of data, it's just a string or something, to say what I want to get the length of, all right? Uh, if I'm gonna print something, I have to pass in a parameter so that, the, so that Python knows what to print. And so these parameters are something that our functions require to perform the task. Uh, in the docs for the mo math module, we see the math.squared function has one parameter named, named x, which is the number that math.square will compute the square root of. If we think about our function that we made a little bit ago uh, called compute area, we passed in two, uh, two parameters, width and height, without which the function would be pointless and we'd never be able to compute the area of anything. But let's think for a second, if I was gonna make a function called um, compute volume of cylinder, uh, what would be the parameters that we would need to be able to do that? Taking you back to middle school, guys. Diameter and length. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we need to know the length or the height of the cylinder, and then either the diameter or the radius of the circle. So, um, yeah. Examples of passing parameters. Okay, so we have math.square root with just a single value being passed in. Uh, print high there, we wanted to print something. Float. Again, to be able to pass in a string and, and convert it to a float, we have to pass in a parameter. Uh, to get the absolute value of something, you have to pass in something. Um, sorted. Anytime you use this sorted function, you have to pass in something to say what you're going to sort. Uh, min, you can pass in anywhere from two to a billion values in here, and it'll tell you which one's the smallest out of all of them. Max, same thing. Uh, length of a number or length of anything, but you'd have to pass in something. Uh, the max of any type of data set really would work with max. Uh, random dot rand int round. Okay. Uh, this second one is an optional parameter. If I just pass in a single number into round, like we did earlier, it'll just round it to a whole number. This second parameter is optional saying to how many decimal points you want to round it to. So if I did say comma two, then instead of rounding it to a whole number, you would just round it to, um, two decimals, and then also length of a word, okay? So hopefully you guys are seeing a pattern here, all right? To be able to use these functions, we have to pass data into them, and then they will be able to do their thing and then return something of value to us, all right? Uh, an argument is the value that is passed through a parameter into a function. In other words, parameters are listed in a function's header, and arguments are listed in a call to the function. In this example code, 
uh, we have x equals 71, math dot square root of x, and math dot square root of 71. 71 is the argument that is passed into the math dot square root function through its parameter x. When a function has more than one parameter and a programmer writes code to call that function, the programmer writes the arguments in the same order as the parameters. All right. So generally in, in industry, people use the words arguments and parameters synonymously. Technically, um, as listed right here, uh, argument is the value that's passed through a parameter and, and parameters are listed in the header. So uh, if we go back here, right here, compute area, all right. Um, these are my arguments, width and height, or sorry, I should say W and H. These are my arguments, the pieces of data that I'm passing in, and then my parameters are listed in the header of the function. Okay, now one thing to note here, uh, if I wanted to, that is perfectly valid. All right, I can pass just straight up data into these functions. Same thing when we have, when we have print, okay? We're just passing data in, and we're gonna say, oh, I'm gonna print this string. I didn't assign this string to a variable first. I just said print invalid product number too many digits. All right, same thing with right here. I have compute area. If I want to, I could pass in two numbers, um, but then once they get up here, one will be the parameter awesome width, and one will, one will be the parameter height. And they'll always be in the same order, left, right, in this common delimited list, okay? So right here for print parameters, um, just looking at this, I know that param three is gonna be, this is a string, Pram two is going to be five, and pram one is going to be one. So, all right, you guys, how are you feeling about everything? Good. Good. I see lots of thumbs up, and no one's crying, so I think that's a good sign. Um, let's see. I think, I think I'm feeling pretty good about this. Um, I'll go ahead and stick around for the next like eight minutes if you guys have any other questions. Uh, I had a couple more slides, but I feel like we've already talked about all of this quite a bit. Um, but do know that we do have some study sessions this week. So if you're looking at your assignment for this week, and you're like, holy cow, how am I supposed to do this? Uh, just know that first off, we have the help channel, which I'm on all the time, so are our TAs, so are other students who've likely had the same, similar questions. Um, so feel free to post on the help channel. But then also um, feel free to work with Omar and Ben who, who, are, who are putting on study sessions each week, throughout the week. Okay, well I'll stick around for questions. Anyone else who wants to go, feel free. I'm gonna stop our recording. Thanks for coming, you guys. All right, thank you. Thank you.